Hello and welcome to episode five of Chatterbox. My name is Callum and I'm an associate artist at Playbox Theatre, the company behind Chatterbox. This is the show where young people from up and down the country talk to artists and industry leaders. And for anyone who might be tuning in for the first time, we've had some fantastic guests on this series already. We've had the star of 1917, George Mackay, star of Sex Education, Amy Lou Wood, and last week was the incredible writer of Posh and the Riot Club, Laura Wade. If you want to check out any of those episodes, you can head over to youtube.com forward slash playbox theatre. And next week, we've got an actor who you may not have heard of yet. In 2019, BAFTA selected him as one of their breakthrough Brits, and he's about to star in a huge HBO sci-fi TV series directed by Hollywood legend Ridley Scott. So, clear your diaries next Friday and come and chat to Abu Bakr Salim. He's going to be one to watch. And if you thought that was good, you just wait till I introduce today's guest. But first, let, you know the drill by now, Chatterboxers. We want you to get involved in these conversations too. So if you're one of the lucky young people with me now in this Zoom interview, get those questions firing in. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen on a laptop or the top of your screen on a mobile, then you should find a button you can click to send questions directly into my inbox. Importantly, you're gonna be able to see the questions other young people have asked, and you can vote for the ones you'd like to hear answered. So the more votes a question has, the higher it appears in my inbox. And guess what? As always, we will try and get through as many as we can. Now, if you're watching live on Facebook, hello. Though you can't message in questions, we still do wanna hear from you. So send us your reactions, comments, feedback to at Playbox Theatre, hashtag Chatterbox on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. We don't mind. Now, time to introduce my special guest. Tracy Braben needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Tracy is the Labour MP for Batley and Spen and is currently Britain's Shadow Culture Secretary. She studied drama at Loughborough University before gaining an MA in screenwriting from the University of the Arts London. As an actor, she spent three years as Trisha Armstrong in Coronation Street, as well as appearing in EastEnders, Midsummer Murders, Law and Order, Emmerdale. As a screenwriter, she's written for Shameless, Hollyoaks, and The Story of Tracy Beaker, amongst many, many others. She became the Labour MP for Batley and Spen in 2016 after the murder of her friend, Labour MP Joe Cox. She made her maiden speech in the House of Commons in November 2016, which won the applause of MPs from all parties. Let's take a look at some highlights from that maiden speech. As someone with unique experience in the arts, as an actor and writer, culture will be of particular interest to me. And I know it can be an engine of change for communities, bringing regeneration and jobs. Our young people in particular deserve nothing less. During the campaign, I visited West Yorkshire Drama Academy, watching many working class kids find their confidence and their voice. I saw myself there. When I was a young actor, I went to castings and I'd be asked, where was I from? When I said Batley, more often than not, people would say, oh yeah, Batley Variety Club. <laughs> the fact that this little club could attract international stars such as Louis Armstrong, Shirley Bassey and the Bee Gees meant there must be something about us that others, others want. Young people's futures are more uncertain than ever, but whatever their ambitions, we must give them hope and belief that they can be the best. Yeah. I would also like to take this moment to thank you, Mr. Speaker, yeah. for your excellent leadership in the aftermath of Joe's tragic yeah. death. Yeah. Coming to Batley, recalling parliaments, arranging ceremonies and giving people space to <coughs> grieve and mourn together was a kindness much appreciated by all in this house and beyond. Yeah. I am honoured to have the opportunity to do my bit and give a voice to my constituents through this parliament of ours. That day will stay with everyone in Batley and Spen for the rest of our lives. But Batley and Spen will not be defined by the one person who took from us, but by the many who give. Yeah. 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 Mr. Philip Davis. Uh, 
I am so thrilled to welcome our fifth guest to Series 2 of Chatterbox, the passionate Labour Shadow Culture Secretary, Tracy Brabin, MP. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us today. An absolute pleasure, and blimey, that took me back. It could be definitely ten years ago, and it's only three and a half, so <laughs> wow. Well, how's, how's lockdown been treating you? I imagine as an MP you've been busier than ever. Well, um, it's been really interesting because the workload has just exploded. People's need is greater, but I can't meet my team. We're all working from home. I'm currently in the office on my own. Um, and I've only just started going out, meeting people in the community. So it's been tough. We've been supporting those who are shielding, uh, those who've lost um, relatives or relatives who've become unwell. Um, also those worried about business, their jobs, and the future, young people worried about university and the next steps, uh, and also people you know, very anxious about the future financially. So lots to do, but also lots to be proud of in that the community coming together, Batley Food Bank, amazing set of volunteers all around the constituency, people trying to do their best. I've been I've been amazed by the kindness actually uh, that has come out during lockdown. That's been a real positive, I think, in our communities. Um, and now, look, our first question actually comes from last week's guest, the Olivier Award-winning playwright Laura Wade. She says, and we're jumping in at the deep end here. Um, if you had two minutes alone with the Prime Minister right now, what would you say to him about saving the industry? What I'd say is, uh, dear Boris, thank you for the money that you've given us up to now. But actually, if you look at Germany and France and other places around the world, they understand that culture isn't just a nice add-on, nice to have. It's actually um, it's every citizen's right to have a cultural life, that it can't just be about bed and work, bed and work. We also have to have an opportunity to dream to belong in communities, to tell stories. And it's really important the government understand that, that all those organizations that are really struggling now are struggling because they had to make money. Surely we should value our creativity enough to say we will invest in you to sustain you when in the good and the bad times um, so that everybody, wherever you live, any town, any village, you will have access to high quality culture, to either participate, to watch, to take part in, to, to share. And the second thing I'd say is, please put art, drama, dance and music at the heart of the curriculum of every primary school and every secondary school. Because all those families that send their children to high, high cost fee paying schools, mm. they can have it because the parents know that it's part of an enrichment as a, as a human being, to have access to culture, to music, to, to dance and drama. So they pay for that. State schools aren't getting it. We want to make sure that all young people have access in their schools, not to be artists or dancers or actors, but to find enrichment and to find flow and support for mental health and a sense of belonging and a sense of community. So I'd say those two things. I'm not sure um, Boris Johnson would be <laughs> smiling very much, but you know we are in a pandemic. But I really do believe that culture will heal us around the country after this horrific pandemic. Well, it, it's it, yeah. I, I've always found it fascinating that there is a sort of hierarchy of subjects in schools that, for some reason, you know, maths and science is sort of right at the top and then there's kind of English right at the bottom below sport is arts mm. um, and I, I going to a state school myself I experienced you know that that hierarchy and it, I was relieved to have a youth theatre to be a part of um, that you know filled that gap for me um, and this the money you've just mentioned the, the 1.5 billion that um, the Culture Secretary and the Chancellor announced was going to help the arts in the pandemic. I wondered if you could explain, because I, I'm no expert, but what, from what I can gather, that that money is going to be used to protect our cultural institutions, in inverted commas. Hmm. So, what, Yeah, what does that mean on a practical level? 
So um, the sector and I am very grateful. 1.57 billion pounds is an awful lot of money. But if you compare it to other European countries, it's, it's not more than that. And it is in, in some cases substantially less. Um, there will be a huge amount of money that goes to um, the national portfolio holders. So they are art institutions um, in the regions as well as in London, but the National Theatre, the Globe, you know, are, um, as the minister said, you know, the national treasures, the jewels in the crown. Um, and there will be substantial amounts of money going to them. There will be also money going to cultural projects that have paused because of the uh, coronavirus. Um, and there will be opportunities for others to access it on more of a piecemeal basis. But my concern is, having been a freelancer for over three decades as an actor and a writer, that the freelancers who are at the moment, so many of them are not eligible for the self-employed income support scheme and are falling through the net. Maybe they are new starters to the business or they were on PAYE freelance contracts or they earn over 50,000 pounds, or they have a limited company, and lots of people are encouraged to be a limited company as an individual. So if you're a sound mixer or a director of photography, you might be a limited company. You don't have um, access to a, a big support scheme. So lots and lots of people are really struggling. Sadly, lots and lots of people, particularly working class artists and creatives, are also leaving because they can't make it work. So my concern on this over this money is you might be able to save your building, but then if you haven't got the artists and creatives, what are you going to put in it? Um, and we've seen um, around the country, theatres not to stay, you know, uh, solvent, are uh, furloughed or let go and made redundant. Many of their staff in, in uh, Plymouth, for example, all the creatives went. Their management stayed because they have to keep the building up and running, but the creatives went. So when we get back to, out of this pandemic, who's going to be left? So um, uh, the money is very welcome, but there are lots of issues that still aren't resolved. And one is very serious. That's about insurance. And it's, uh, it's boring, isn't it, insurance? But unless an organization ca can get an insurance policy that will protect them from uh, closure because of COVID, then they can't they can't basically take the risk, so they can't create. So that's something that the government haven't addressed that's really important. Um, uh, I, I also think young people and youth theatres, community theatres, um, uh, creative work that comes out of libraries or um, you know towns and villages, that might not be a national portfolio holder, but it's of equal value. Musicians as well, they've been absolutely left out of the support scheme. And we've seen that smaller venues just can't make it work with social distancing. So they've been closing. So where are we going to get our next, I don't know, Stormzy or Maxine Peak if yeah. those smaller venues um, are just collateral damage, uh, you know, due to the pandemic? So I've been asking the department to try and make sure that freelancers and creatives are that money, it, there is a, um, a, a sort of pathway for them to access money. Now, the, the, um, the Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, did say, oh, look, in August, we're all going to get 50% off our, off our meals. But actually, if you've got no job, you're not going out for dinner. And I, I do feel there could have been more of a, a campaign to try and support freelancers to at least try and get some money coming in so that they can contribute to the economy as well. So you might have a theatre, and I've just been to the Lawrence Batley Theatre this morning in, in um, Huddersfield, and they have a quadrangle outside of the front of the theatre, and they're being very imaginative. They're putting chairs and tables there, and they're going to turn it into an outdoor space in order to try and get actors in to do Romeo and Juliet in the open air. Absolutely brilliant idea. Um, I really support it. But if those working class actors or those actors can't sustain it, they can't support the theatre in that way. So it's really vital that we try and support the freelancer going forward. Well, a lot of young people watching this are going to be aspiring actors, directors, writers, stage managers, jobs that, as you say, are for the most part freelance. And what is ordinarily a daunting and financially perilous industry suddenly seems more so. What do you think we can do to ensure that 
young people who are about to step into the industry still have the confidence to pursue those passions? Well, I'm not going to be, you know, dishonest. It's going to be a, a tough ride for the next few months. The sector is paused. Um, while some TV, um, I know that Emmerdale is back and uh, some of the soaps are back, some of the Netflix shows are back that were paused halfway through, it's going to be a slow process of, of coming back. So what I would advise is that you must make your own work. You've got to start now, not waiting for someone else to give you a job, not waiting for someone else's approval. You have friends who are like-minded. Get together, start thinking about what sort of content you can create. And it, it's never been easier with TikTok and you know everybody has a, a, a camera in their pocket. Um, please just think about starting to write starting to have ideas because when things start um, uh, up and running again what we'll be looking for more than ever is content and particularly young voices um, that will be left out of the sort of landscape because there won't have been opportunities for them my own uh, my youngest has just finished drama school doing an MA at Mountview oh, wow. and um, you know really tough for her and her year group because there's got no show uh, they've got no you know performance it's really hard getting an agent if they can't see you in a proper meeting where you can just chat over a cup of tea. But also I'm very worried about the next group going to drama school because they will have certainly three months of uh, just Zooming, you know, um, teaching. And we know, don't we, that the creative industries, the creative sector is it, it's tactile and it's robust and it's about being in a space together in a box and, you know, sh you know sharing work, sharing ideas. So I think that's going to be tough. So please think about making your own content. My youngest that I have just mentioned is um, also a drag queen. And she did, um, she's done some competitions where she's got a bit of um, notice. And in fact, today she was just doing some filming auditioning for, I think it was a commercial, but the, the buyout was eight grand. You know, it is, uh, but they, they, she's only come to people's, um, awareness because of her Instagram pe page and, and what she's been doing in the competition. So find a niche, you know, whatever your niche is, explore that niche, whether it's been cycling or whether it's a singer or whether it's, you know, you're, you're really a great painter or you can do good mask work um, or you do voiceovers because don't forget there's still radio, there's still commercials that need those young voices so, you know, try and do a little reel, a little um, series of different adverts that you've copied off the telly, um, put them down, send them out as a, a link so people can hear them who are voiceover agents. You know, there's lots of ways of writing poetry, trying to get people to take notice of your creativity. But I'm not going to lie, it's going to be really, really tough. And if you haven't got family money and you don't live in London, it's going to be even tougher. So I would say just try and find your niche, work with your mates, because they're going to be the superstars of the future along with you. Mm. So, you know, use each other's talents and just, you know, stay optimistic because this pandemic will pass, but it will be those people who've used this time to create content that will be of more interest. That's fantastic. Really practical advice. Um, thank you. And I think in your maiden speech, you, if you go back in 2016, you, you mentioned that you thought culture could be um, an engine for change in communities. And I think one thing we've seen in lockdown, particularly in the West End, but I'm sure across the country, is that there's a really strong ecosystem surrounding theatres. Restaurants, bars, shops that survive based on the footfall of, of theatre. And, and this, this week or last week, I think we heard about Boris's, you know, build, 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 a series of infrastructure projects to keep people out of unemployment and the economy going. But I wondered if you thought there was a way that culture and our cultural industries could do the same thing. There's no doubt about it. You only have to look at what's happened in Halifax after Happy Valley and, um, oh gosh, what's the other show with the, the, the love story with the two older characters? Oh, um, Tango in Halifax. That's Tango in Halifax. Um, you know, those, once you start being known as a community that has great locations, and certainly in Yorkshire we do, but also about skills, so skilled crew, it's really, really important. Um, once you get known in an area for crew and um, space, 
I think you can have inward investment. Um, and uh, certainly it's happening, I see, see it happening in Leeds. Uh, it's, it's led by Screen Yorkshire and they've a number of um, upskilling projects for the creative industry. So to get local young people upskilled to a really good standard so they can be taken on board in, on shows that are being filmed locally by Sky, by Channel 4, because they've moved to Leeds, as you know. Um, and, you know, local productions need local high quality crew and certainly when i um when i became when i was first mp in that summer i was patron of the batley and spen youth theater and we did a production of les mis which was joe it was in honor of joe in um and it was her favorite musical oxfam gave us their recycling warehouse that was stacked with bales of clothes they emptied it we turned it into a theater it cost her hundreds of thousands that we raised we turned it into a um, traverse theatre, so the audience were looking at each other. And we did, uh, there was a hundred young people who rehearsed at Leeds University. They were all residential for three weeks. Um, they, they did the production of Les Mis, but they also created their own project called More in Common to, about the values of Joe, feminism, uh, equality and justice. Um, it was the most amazing summer uh, and an extraordinary transformative um, period for those young people, over a hundred young people from across the community. But what was transforming was everybody who worked on it was at the top of their game, all the adults. They're from the West End, West End producers, West End mm. um, uh, director, music director, who's now on Hamilton. You know, their the standard was really high. So the opportunity for mentoring was incredible. Now from that cohort, um, there's been a number who've already gone into the industry at a very high level. One who was the PA to the producer is, uh, was, is now at Slunglow in Leeds. Um, uh, one young woman went on to write a play that then the National, it was a competition, the National did a professional production of Alice's play. Um, others went on to drama school, um, you know, high quality drama schools, uh, and some went to university. Some will become teachers or lawyers or parents, but for that experience, all of them gained an extraordinary amount of experience. And it is that, that attaching yourself to somebody who can mentor you and help you upskill yourself, because that is what is going to be needed more than ever, is people with some work experience and some skills. And so if you like costume making for yourself at home, as well as being an actor, you know, you can make um, costumes for shows, trying to find other ways to monetize your skills during this tough period will be important. But getting back to the question, when you have a product like um, Happy Valley, the impact is the, ec the ecosphere, the impact is phenomenal. It is taxi drivers, hotels, um, uh, local restaurants, local uh, costume hire places, uh, money that goes into local people's pockets who are security or extras. It's really, really powerful tool for regeneration. And it's something I've been really banging on about in Batley and Spen with the council, with um, the LEP in Leeds and City Region. It's, I know it can bring, bring jobs because it can bring those high quality jobs to our area. So you don't have to leave and go to London. You can stay near your family and friends where you grew up and travel um, outside of the area to work uh, and keep and you know and keep that money coming in at a very high standard so it you know it, it really can transform communities and you get known for being the place where you go if you want talent and that's something that I've been working on that people are now saying um, in fact there's a, a show being set up in Leeds and they want um, young uh, Asian actors, South Asian actors. I, I know now more than, than I've ever known. And so we can start to build up a, a reputation for being good at something above and beyond making biscuits and beds, which is what we're usually <laughs> known for. It'd be great to be making superstars as well. Well, that um, Les Mis sounds like an incredible 
uh, undertaking. It, sounds... it was life changing. It was life changing for so many people. And the testimonies from the parents were were actually, you know, we had standing ovations. We were sold out. But the testimonies from the parents were the ones that, that, that made it all worthwhile. Um, uh, um, comments from parents like, my, my son was really struggling with his mental health. Uh, we couldn't get him out of his bedroom. And now he wants to be a playwright. Um, a young woman who was self-harming, who's now gone to drama school. You know, there's, if you feel lost and hopeless, you're, it's so bad for your mental health. And you have to have a glimmer of hope that you will be able to fulfill your dreams. And I, I, I remember listening to a psychiatrist, it's really stuck with me, that if you take away all those, all those awful things in life that you have to cope with, such as a divorce or a bereavement or even moving house, the one thing that can contribute to poor mental health is not fulfilling your potential or following your dreams. And, and I really think for so many young people, they just don't know how to get started. But, you know, I would say just try and attach yourself to people who you think are doing stuff and try and get on, on their coattails and just try and get involved because you can't change your life in your bedroom. It's really important to get out and say, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that and put yourself out there. And I've always thought when I was asked, having, you know, being an actor and a writer, I, was, I had a lovely career, a really nice career. I traveled the world, worked with some amazing people. But when I was asked, would I, did I want to be the MP for Batley and Spen after Joe's murder? Mm -hmm. I said yes immediately because the things you regret are the things you don't do. Always walk through that open door. Who knows what's on the other side? But you will regret it if you don't. As the years roll on, you'll think, oh, you know, that time when I had that thing that I could have done. Um, you know, be brave. Be brave and have confidence in your ability because more than anything, those middle class um, you know, middle-aged men don't know how you think and they need you to tell those great, exciting stories that is going to make them loads of money. So you and your experiences are so valued and so needed and now more than ever, particularly after Black Lives Matter, where we need the diversity of storytelling, that inclusivity, you know, stories from disabled performers, people with, you know, neurological challenges. We want those stories. We need them because you reflect the complexity of the human condition. Well, you mentioned there um, that it was an easy decision to step into politics from an incredibly successful acting and writing career. Um, I wondered, off the back of you know, things like Shouldergate, shall we? If <laughs> um, anybody who doesn't know what Shouldergate was, um, Tracy was standing at the dispatch box in the House of Commons and she leant forward. I think you had a broken ankle, didn't you? Um, to support yourself. And your dress slipped and exposed your shoulder. Um, and the, uh, the abuse that you received was, uh, I've not seen anything like it, abhorrent. It was really, really horrible. Um, I wondered, there may be young people watching this who, who want to affect change in the world, and I wondered whether you felt it, if it was a difficult time to be a woman in politics with the Prime Minister uh, that we have, um, or, or for young people who might be thinking, maybe I would like to go into politics. I, I wonder if you have any advice for them. Yeah, sure. But just to fill, fill in the end of the story, because the, the end of the story is where the glory is, that uh, okay. the, abuse was yeah. so, the abuse was so horrible. But I did a very dry tweet about quoting what people were saying. And it was all highly sexualized. Um, it, it wasn't that I looked shabby, but I looked like a slut, a slatter, and like I just had sex. Like, you know, it was really quite horrible. And I quoted them and said, who knew people could get so overheated about a shoulder? And that got caught quite a bit of attention on Twitter and it got shared loads. And I got really excited. I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I auctioned the ASOS 35 pound dress. And I've been working with the Girl Guides because they did a survey that was a very high percentage of under 16 year olds, girls were ashamed of their bodies. And I was so shocked and hurt, you know, upset by this. I thought I'll auction the dress and I give all the money to Girl Guides. And I thought, oh, you know, wouldn't it be great if I got 200 quid? I, in the end, 20,200 pounds went to the Girl Guides. So wow. in a way, in a way, the, the, the story is a celebration of, 
you don't let the trolls get you. Because they, they're sat in their mum's back bedroom in the wife front, eating pot noodles, trying to, you know, have a pop at you. They've done nothing in their lives. They've not been brave. They've not stood up. They're not trying to change the world. You know, they're, not, they're, they're nothing to worry about. It's, it's a way that you approach this sort of abuse. And it, it is a bit crap. You know, of course, I'm not going to lie. During the Brexit um, negotiations, for the first time ever, I had to have a police um, uh, presence at my surgeries because I was getting so much really, un, you know, unpleasant abuse. And also I was worried for my staff, actually. Mm. But, but you also have to respond in a way that actually is water reducts back because what they want is they want you to be upset. This is what they want. They want you to be cowed. And the reason why they picked me was because I was a woman at the dispatch box of the House of Commons calling out the Prime Minister. And it actually, in a way, was great as well because it amplified um, the message that I was saying at the dispatch box because I was invited to lots of shows to talk about my shoulder and the money and the dress. But I was able to then say the reason why I was there was number 10, we're excluding journalists from briefings about mm. Brexit. And that's actually counter to everything we believe in in a democratic uh, country, that journalists should be allowed to hear all the facts. So I was able to, and so on. So I was able to get my message out there and it amplified it even more. So the trolls, um, it was a bad day at the office for them. Trolls nil, Tracy won, I'd like to say. Um, but I would, I would say that proves, and it's constant, isn't it? A woman is always judged for how she looks. Um, is she attractive? Does she look smart? Whereas guys can get away with it. They just look a bit scruffy. But no one would hypersexualize what they were wearing. Um, it, it, you know, it is something that, we, we, that needs to stop. But the only way it will stop is if there are more women in power. And, it, you know, there are more of us than them. So it's really important that we step up, we support each other, because it, sometimes it can be a bit lonely. So try and support each other, try and, you know, encourage each other. And I would say for all those young people on this call, if you're not on a student council, get on a student council. We need to hear your voice. If you've never been to the House of Parliament, write to your MP. You have a right as a citizen to go to the House of Parliament and your MP to show you around. Uh, it's one of the joys of my job, taking young people around the House of Commons saying, I grew up on a council estate in a two bedroom flat. I never thought I'd be in this building. I'd never even been until I got the job. You know, so you, you have a right to be in that building and you're, uh, you have a right to have your voice heard. So please get involved because if you know, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Black Lives Matter has proved anything. There is so much that needs to be changed. And that those in power need to listen to what young people have to say, because this is your future, not ours. It's yours. How, how do you want it to look? Tell us. Get involved. That's so fantastic. Now, look, we, we need to start answering all these questions that have been coming in. Um, but we're going to kick off by getting someone up on screen to ask a question camera to camera. So Rich, our technical magician, is going to magic Emily onto your screen. Now, Emily Pepper is a member of Playbox, the youth theatre who produced Chatterbox. She's a fantastic actor. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, Emily, but I think you've attended every single Chatterbox interview right from the very start, haven't you? Is that right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, Emily, what's your question for, for Tracy? Uh, my question is, do you think that your acting skills have enabled you to have the confidence to stand up in Parliament and present a clear point? That is such a brilliant question. Beautifully delivered, I have to say. Um, uh, so you could tell you're going to be a really good actor. Uh, I do think, yeah, there's no doubt about it that um, the skills of an actor about presentation, about faking it till you make it, about pretending, tr you know, not showing your nerves, those things um, have helped. And I must say, standing in the House of Commons doing my maiden speech, in the circumstances with which I got into the job, holding back the tears is an actor's skill as well, I think, not to be overwhelmed by what you're saying. Um, and I found that certainly in the first few months when I was lost more times than I can tell you, I was in meetings where I didn't know what I was supposed to be talking about. I didn't know who the people were. 
you know, I had to really fake it. Uh, and then you do get to learn and you, and then you get the confidence because you know what you're talking about. So you don't need to act it anymore, but there's no doubt about it. Writing speeches, writing Facebook posts, um, uh, empathy, I think for the first six months in the role uh, as a, in, being an MP, every time someone saw me, not every time, but you know, often I'd be door knocking or uh, meeting people in the street and people would cry because they were so sad to have lost Joe. And to have empathy, to be able to listen, I think, I think that's often a skill of a good actor is that you can be empathetic so that you, you can understand your character, even the bad guys, you know, when you're playing a really uh, cruel person, often you find your empathy tries to find some reason why they're cruel or what happened to them and all of that. And I think empathy is also important to be a good MP to understand how hard life is for some people. Um, so writing was helpful, that experience. And obviously performing, um, uh, I was doing media uh, on the news uh, and, you know, the words that I was using weren't uh, natural to me. Um, not, off, you know, I hadn't spoken them for decades before campaigning to be an MP. So I was having to learn a whole new sort of script as well. Um, so there's no doubt about it. That was very helpful. And um, it's about, you know, building, building on that, but also then delivering um, as your constituents would expect you to do. It's not just about playing a part. You also have to deliver the goods and to do the work. And I must say the work of um, a writer, when I was on Hollyoaks, I was writing at sometimes three scripts in different stages. So first draft, second draft, third draft. And I often work 12 hour days to turn those scripts around. You get paid very well, but it's, it's a really intense, tough life. I don't think I've worked as hard be, um, ever being an MP. You know, it is a really hard job. It's a vocation in the same way an actor or, or writer is. You do it because you love it. And so it's a lifestyle. But, um, you know, I think that resilience and that robustness of doing hard work as a, a freelancer has really helped. So I don't expect a nine to five with my weekends off. You know, I, I know what's required to do a, a job and do it well is, you know, you throw yourself into it and work hard. So have you, have you applied to drama school or are you going, you know, are you at home? What's happening to you at the moment? Are you at college? Well, I'm, I'm in year 10 at the minute. So it's, I'm mainly just focusing on my school, but I'm doing a lot of drama at school and in like the productions and stuff. Which is cool. And you're from Derby, are you? I'm from Coventry. Oh, Coventry. Oh, okay. Well, Coventry is the city of culture. Yeah. And, yeah, you're going to be involved in any of that? Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, that would be good because I know that there was a real worry that um, the money that the minister announced wouldn't ensure that Coventry kept the city of culture because if you lose all your creatives and your artists, what are you going to do for city of culture? So I really hope you get involved and do keep me, um, my email is just the usual parliamentary one. So drop me a line and let me know if you're still, you know, if, if you're doing anything in the city of culture, it'd be good to know. Okay, yeah. thank you. Great, thank you so much for that question, Emily. Cheers, Emily. Thank you. Bye, love, bye. Bye. Um, now, before we head over to the Q&A, we did a poll earlier on our Instagram account and we gave everyone the chance to pitch a question for you to answer. We picked our two favourites and held a vote, very democratically. And the question that people want to know the answer to, we've got 89% of the vote, Tracy. So it's, the, so it's a big one. What would you most like to change about the arts industry? Right. Well, I think what's important is that towns and villages have access to high quality art. So what we need, every community should have an art center, every community. And certainly where I am, um, there's lots of different offers, dance schools and so on, but there's no central place where if you're interested in the arts, you know that's for you. And out of that art center, there should always be in every community, a youth theater. Mm. And a youth theatre that is not a money-making exercise for a large corporation. 
It's a youth theatre that's embedded in the community, that knows you, that embraces you, that's inclusive in the way that Chicken Shed, I don't know if you know Chicken Shed com Theatre Company, that are, there's no auditions, everybody can join. If you've got a disability, you just bring your carer with you or you're someone who supports you. Inclusive theatre for all, uh, a youth theatre as, as part of an arts centre because it shouldn't have to be that you need to travel to your nearest big city to, to follow your dream or you know, be part of something. And in, this, in, my, in my fantasy art center, there'd be an art room, there'd be a black box theater space, and there'd be a juice bar, and then there'd be a music tech studio, and then there'd be a, a speakeasy type of comedy stand-up music venue type of thing all in one space that sounds brilliant let's get that made i need we just i just need to get into government and just let me be the <laughs> boss and then we can sort it it's so frustrating being in opposition you can't get hardly anything done next time next time um now oh, we've got loads of questions here i'm gonna i'm conscious we've got about 10 15 minutes so let's I'll try and get through as many as I can, people who've sent them in. Um, so this is Elodie, who's had lots of votes. Now that you have a career on the political side of theatre and culture, what have you learned about how the industry is viewed by government? It's very interesting, and what a great question. One thing that has struck me since I became an MP, they've had half a dozen culture ministers. Mm. Now, it seems to me that that they, the Conservatives see culture as um, not as essential as business or as international affairs or, you know, the political big boy stuff. The culture's over there and you, it's a sort of um, a, a training ground for the next steps up to something more important. I think culture should be the heart, at the heart of industrial strategy. If we just hold the front page, if we used um, culture and all the decisions of the government came through the culture departments and fed out the other side, how different our world would look. You know, we would be focused on well-being and good, strong mental health and culture for its own sake and not for money. You know, we would be saying that everybody has a right to it. We would be we'd have a different education policy, we'd have a different town planning policy, we'd have a different uh, international policy because we'd be wanting to open up and share our knowledge and share, like for example, European uh, films or European talents and sharing our knowledge. We, you know, we would look at things in a very different way. For example, the NHS. I'm a real believer for social prescribing. So you go to your doctor and, and you don't get a prescription for pills. You get a prescription for something that would help you in another way. So we've got a great organization here called Creative Minds. And if you're struggling with isolation, loneliness or depression or, you know, a more challenging mental health crises, uh, Creative Minds are brilliant at working with you. Now, I see the future as actors training to deliver and creatives training to deliver social prescribing in communities. So if all these big sort of macho departments had a cultural filter, there's lots of other ways that we could deal with this. Think about how education would be or even transport where there would be busking in the, you know, as, as part of the build when you build a new bus station or there would be music playing in, re in, in on the, the tube or, you know, there's, there's lots of things that we could be more excited about in the way that our, ta our towns look, our high streets look, if we thought that culture was actually important. And let's not forget, last year, culture and the creative industries brought in 112 billion pounds to the economy. For every pound spent by the government, it's often five to ten pounds that the community, the you know, the or the the treasury get back. So this isn't just about you know the flowers and the you know the, the you know the sort of hippy dippy. It's actually economic argument, 
and also a well-being argument for citizens and, and for our, you know, the future of our planet and our children's well-being. So it's, it's really, you know, I, I'm really frustrated that particularly this government don't see it as a, a vital, a must-have. Um, and it's more, you know, nice to have. And if you're middle class and you can afford to go to the opera, it's a nice bit of, a, you know, a, something to do at the weekend. It actually should be something that touches our lives every day of the week. That's great. I'm going to push on with another question. This is, this is a non-politics question. Um, Phoebe would love to know, um, did you feel you were at an advantage or disadvantage pursuing acting, having studied drama at a university rather than drama school? Yeah, I, I had a bit of um, a chip on my shoulder about not going to drama school because I got a place, the drama school doesn't exist anymore, it's Weber Douglas. Mm. Um, I'd finished my degree, I did a degree in drama, and then I got a place to do um, a post-grad in acting at Weber, Weber Douglas. But I'd never been to London and I didn't know anybody in London. I was so scared, I had no money. I just didn't know how I'd do it. I didn't know where I'd live or how I'd make, how would I even get there? So I was singing in a band at the time and, and in Loughborough and they got a record deal and we were really rubbish. But anyway, we got a record deal. And I used that as a way to say, oh, I'm not going to drama school. I'm going to pursue singing. Well, I can't sing. And I knew that, but I was too afraid and just didn't know how to go to drama school. So that stayed with me. However, what was very interesting was my biggest break. I did five years of community theater theatre and education all around the country, going where the work was and, you know, in B&Bs and all of that. But my big break came in a show called A Bit of a Do opposite. At the time, he was hugely famous, David Jason, playing his girlfriend. But they wanted somebody that was deeply authentic and real. And I wonder if I'd have gone to drama school, I'd have lost that naivety and um, lack of understanding about the business that probably got me the job and just if I could give you one example Sandra was a really clumsy waitress and I came into one scene in rehearsal and I got a tray of, of snacks and the line is and the way I said it was would anybody like a canap and all the other actors in the room were going oh darling that's so funny that's exactly how she'd say it and I'm like I've no idea what they're talking about it says canap in the script you know I don't I didn't even know what a canapé was you know, so I hadn't ever been at a party where canapes were served. So I think not going to drama school, whilst I'd got a chip on my shoulder about it, in a way made me different and mm -hmm. real. And so for all those people who think, you know, I can't afford drama school, I'm worried about, you know, you know going and it all being virtual, I'm going to take a year out and give it a go. There's something about having pride in being different. Well, that sort of links back to what you were saying early on as well about um, pursuing what interests you and making your own work. I think that's a, a lovely um, link. This might have to be our last question. I'm so conscious of the time. Um, this is from Isabella, who says, and maybe we could do this for uh, both of your careers, if you like. What's the, um, what's the best advice you've received about the industry? But well, we could do the political industry as well as the cultural industry. Best advice about the industry? Um... Well, be yourself. I think in, in politics, people can see when you're not being mm. yourself. There's no doubt about it because you seem inauthentic. Um, and as an actor, be yourself because you can't be what they want because you don't know what it is. So trying to second guess in an audition, you're on a hiding to nothing. Be yourself and then when you don't get it, it's because they didn't go that way. They went older or slimmer or, or darker or, you know, a, a different accent. But you can be true to yourself because going to, and I've done it myself, go to castings, trying to pretend to be something else because it's what you think they want, doing an accent or whatever. You always feel a bit like a charlatan. And then when you don't get it, you think, oh, they saw through me. You know, they knew it wasn't the real me. So, I, you know, I would say be yourself. But also try and find the joy in it because it is incredibly stressful, the creative industries. And it can get you down. And you can spend an awful lot of time comparing yourself um, with other actors. My eldest 
um, is now an actor. And she spends far too much time on IMDb working out who's more famous than others. <laughs> it's all nonsense. It makes no difference to your career, uh, particularly in the UK. Just focus on the work. It's not about being famous. It's about focusing on the work and doing that work, whatever the work is, whether it's just one small scene or whether it's a drag show or whether it's music and do it to the best of your ability. And remember, one, one really good uh, bit of advice is there's always someone watching you. So someone might not, you might not know them yet, but they are scouting for talent and they might have their eye on you. So be aware that you're not doing it into a void. There might be people watching going, oh, what's their next um, bit of comedy skit on TikTok? Let's have a look at that. So, you know, always be aware that whatever you do, try and do it to the best of your ability. That is fantastic advice. And that just about concludes this episode of Chatterbox. But look, before we wrap up, Tracy, I wondered if you'd be kind enough to share something to go on our lockdown list, our selection of things to keep us stimulated in isolation. Um, well, there's lots of really good apps out there for um, well-being and calm. And I think um, one of the things that's really helped me and my youngest over the lockdown was the 10,000 steps. Um, you could get it on your phone or it's an app, um, just to make sure you try and get 10,000 steps a day because it forces you out the house. Mm. Um, and also if you haven't done 10,000, you go down the stairs and you just feel like you've achieved something to keep you fit um, during lockdown because it has been tough, hasn't it? And all, you know, whilst i've been working full time i've been living with three fur furloughed adults so they've been baking they've been you know sitting around they've been reading uh, in the nice weather sunbathing but you know you, that can affect your mental health if you're not also trying to keep fit so get your ten thousand steps in that's great excellent advice um now that is all we've got time for today join me same time next week when i'll be talking to one of bafta's breakthrough brits star of HBO's Raised by Wolves, Jamestown, Black Mirror. He's performed at the Donmar Warehouse, the Hampstead, the National Theatre. He was BAFTA nominated for his voiceover for the video game Assassin's Creed. And he's only 27. Wow. It's the one and only Abu Baker Salim. In the spirit of keeping the creative conversation going week to week, um, I think you've got a question for Abu. Is that right, Tracy? Yeah. How did you keep creative during lockdown? Brilliant. Excellent. Well, tune in to see how Abu answers that one. Um, if you've enjoyed today's episode and want to catch up on any of our previous episodes, head over to youtube.com forward slash Playbox Theatre. And don't forget, we want to hear what you think. So send us your thoughts, reactions, feedback to at Playbox Theatre, hashtag Chatterbox on whatever social media channels you like to use. Uh, before we wrap up, just a quick reminder as well that Playbox Theatre, the youth theatre who produce Chatterbox, are in the middle of a £50,000 fundraising appeal that is absolutely critical to its survival. So if you've enjoyed this episode and would like to support the company who make it, head over to justgiving.com forward slash playbox dash theatre. Um, to everybody who's in this meeting with us today, I'm so sorry we didn't get through more questions. Tracy, there were some incredible questions here about universal basic income, actors using their platform to engage in political disputes. The young people have been really engaged by your presence today. So thank you so, so much for joining us. We really Absolute appreciate pleasure. it. Absolute pleasure. And remember, if there's anything you want to ask about culture or you live in Yorkshire, uh, please do contact me on my email. Fantastic. And we'll make sure um, we, we put that along with this video so everyone can access it. Um, great. Well, thank you, all Chatterbox partners, for streaming this up and down the country. We couldn't do it without you. And thank you to everyone at home for watching. Until next Friday, stay creative and see you soon. Goodbye. Bye.